Coming up on Tech Thing, whoa, kill switches save smartphones. Bargain router pick, don't like LastPass? We got three alternatives. Need a new GPU? PC Pro's Ryan Shroud joins us. All that and more coming up on Tech Thing. Tech Thing is brought to you by viewers like you. If you get value from the show and would like to support us directly, please consider contributing over at patreon.com slash tech thing. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. At least on the good days. <laughs> so, okay, I should point out, you may notice something different about my iPhone it's 6. It's not broken! You might notice two things about my iPhone 6. Uh, one, my replacement iPhone is sealed in a life-proof case. Uh, I dropped the first one waiting for my case to arrive. Mm -hmm. uh, then I bent it. So it turns out like the, the, <laughs> the phone pocket on my pants oh, with 40 no. pounds of toddler on my back and a backpack. Uh, and I came down and I bent the case. You bent it? I bent the for case. Real? It still ran, but there was a there was a noticeable curve. I mean, I've seen videos, but I was just like, dude. This is why I can't have nice things. Yeah. Yeah. We can't we can't <laughs> give Patrick anything here. Now I have armor <laughs> on my Well, I was laughing because it's like it, you know, it feels so smooth and svelte and, of and course. it has no structural rigidity whatsoever. Nope, you're gonna break it too. Oh, so no, speaking no, no, no. of cell phones. <laughs> life proof armor. You got water. Life proof here. armor, yeah. There no, we go. This is why I love life proof. Oh gosh. No, really. Oh no. It's awesome. <gasps> okay, yeah. Just be careful. No, it's okay. Oh, it's coffee. Yeah. Oh, Lord. What did you think it was? Oh boy. Well, it looks like kill switches on cell phones actually work. Surprise, yeah. surprise. So the number of stolen iPhones dropped by 40% in San Francisco and 25% in New York in the last 12 months after Apple Inc. added a kill switch to its devices in September of 2013. So in London, smartphone theft dropped by half, according to an announcement by officials in three different cities. Yeah. Smartphone theft was, well, it was a huge problem over here in California, especially it's in places like San Francisco. Half of the crimes reported in California, primarily in LA, San Francisco, Oakland. Um, That's insane. Half the crimes reported were, were smartphone thefts. That's a Reuters That's, article yeah. that, that you were quoting. Um, it's kind of, a, one of the things they point out in the article is, is Apple turns uh, the kill switch on out of the box. And the kill switch means you can remotely kill the phone if it gets stolen. Bricks it. Mm -hmm. um, Google and Samsung have adopted kill switches, but depending yes. on the model, it may or may not actually be turned on when you buy it. I'm not sure if my Note 4 has one. I'll have to check into it, but I, I do have the ability yeah. to just lock it down. So maybe that is their kill switch. <laughs> maybe. So Benjamin writes ask at techthing.com. He said, hey, Patrick and Shannon, I'm in the market for a new Wi-Fi router, but I haven't really kept up on the router market for the last couple of years. I don't need AC, but I do need something that will work well in my Wi-Fi saturated apartment. Also, it would be awesome to find something under a hundred bucks, but I'm willing to pay more if there is a good reason to. So what would you suggest to get the biggest bang for my buck? Keep up the great work, enjoying the new show. Thanks, Benjamin. Well, thanks, Benjamin. Thank you. Um, it's kind of funny. Asus, Netgear, Linksys, all doing some badass stuff at the high end. Uh, but the bargain rounder for like 2.4 gigahertz, 802.11 uh, uh, BGN, this is sick. TP-Link TLWR841N. It's an N300 for home router. It's $19.99. What? So that's and it's not a bad yeah. router. I mean, look, like, you know, TP-Link is doing some really good stuff. Um, we actually ran one of its cousins, the uh, WR940N, um, uh, yes. with the three antennas in the Techzilla studio uh, and on basically in our testing lab, the Techzilla studio, right. uh, running the Gargo firmware for a couple of years. Uh, we we restarted like once a week. Other than that, we did nothing to it. Sometimes we didn't even restart it for a couple of months. But basically. $25, you're good to go on 2.4 gigahertz. Golden. Yeah, if you want 5 gigahertz, um, and I will say at short range, an N900 router can make a big bump, at least in my yes. house, a huge download difference. Uh, this is Asus's RT N66U dual band wireless N900 gigabit router. That's like $115. People love that That's router. That's a good one. It's a really good router. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the Netgear N600 dual band Wi-Fi router, that's about $80. I've used that a lot. And there should be one more that's slightly less expensive around here. There it is, TP-Link TL WDR4300 wireless N750 dual band router. Um, that's running $68.60. Nice, not bad. So, I think I originally bought that Asus when it was like 200 bucks or something. Like that. <laughs> and the prices, they creep down. They go but, down, yeah. Yeah, and it's, I, I will say, if you don't have any, 
we'll talk more about AC. We will. <laughs> and fancy routers. 200 plus routers. Yeah, things that will speed up Wi-Fi next week. So fire out any of those questions that you have about home networking. Ask at techthing.com. And we'll try to fit them into the show next week. Because it gets interesting. There's like yes. a $20 router. <laughs> there's like an $80 router. And then there's like a $300 router. Yeah. Probably don't. Well, we'll get into it. Next week. <laughs> What's going on over at Hack5 this week? So I host a show called Hack 5 with Darren Kitchen here in the same building. This week I am actually checking out the difference between analog and digital inputs in respect to my Arduino that I've been building a pond. And Darren is across the pond. He will be joining us next week with his journeys in Europe. So you can check out everything that he's doing over at hackacrosseurope.com, including some really cool meetups that he's going to be attending. And you can check out all of our shows over at hak5.org. Time for our rapid fire round. This is where we try to answer three questions, give three recommendations, or review three products in less than one minute each. This week, ladies and gentlemen, Shannon Morris has three alternatives to LastPass. Are you ready, Shannon? I'm ready. Go. I'm ready to go. Go. Okay, so some people really, really hate LastPass, and some people love it for all their different reasons. It has its pros and its cons, just like any other app. So just in case LastPass isn't the password manager for you, I completely understand. And you can check out lots of different ones. So I've got three top ones for you this week. So first off, I wanted to talk about KeePass. KeePass you can find over at keepass.info, which is over here. This is a very close contender to LastPass. It is open source and it's free. It's completely free. There's no yearly things or anything like that. It runs on tons of different platforms and there are plugins available for stuff like two-factor authentication, for syncing across devices, for auto-filling in your browser, et cetera, et cetera. So anything you want to do with your password manager, you can probably find in this plugin. It does auto-generate passwords and secure notes as well. It is a little bit harder to set up than LastPass, but it, it, because it's not as fluid of an integration into your browsers, you will have to do the plugins and whatnot. Everything is stored locally, so there's no need to trust anybody else's servers, which is very important. And you have to download a local copy of KeePass to use it. But if you are interested, this is what it looks like on your computer. So it's just a nice little EXE executable download from Windows. And as soon as I want to set up a new key, I just click new, Add Entry, and I enter in my Facebook credentials or whatever I want to hit, click OK, and there you go. It's now saved in there and I can use it wherever I want. So the second one is called 1Password and that is over at agilebits.com slash 1Password. This one stores passwords, notes, and secure forms. It even stores credit card credentials if you want it to. Think about this one though, it costs 50 bucks for a license up front. Up to 20 items in the vault are free for a 30 day free trial. They do have that so you can test it out. Requires a download. Everything is encrypted locally but it is not open source. iOS and Android apps are available for it as well as a browser extension. However, there is no two-factor authentication for their own reasons and I understand them but it does include a password generator. You can sync across devices which is very nice and it is really, really easy to use and it's very, very clean. If you open up their password trial, so I have the trial running right here, you can notice that it does look similar to KeePass, but when you compare the two, mm -hmm. this executable is a lot cleaner. It's very, very much easier to use, so I can understand why a lot of businesses would probably want to check this one out as opposed to KeePass, the open source one. Now we have Keeper. That is the last one I wanted to mention today. This one is a new one for me, so I just recently checked this out. Keeper is at keepersecurity.com. It's $9.99 a year for one device or $30 a year for unlimited devices. Yay! But you do have a 30-day free trial with this one, too. Encryption happens on the user's end before transfer to Keeper Cloud Vault, and it is not open source. So again, you run into that issue of it not being open source. Uh, you do have, they have the touting of the ease of use with mobile. The funny thing is I can do the same thing with LastPass. Mm -hmm. So I can do, for example, I can swipe my fingerprint to unlock my LastPass vault, which is really cool. And that's something that Keeper is really, really touting on their, on their website as well as autofills. And I was like, oh. I can do that with LastPass too. Cool. They do offer two-factor two authentication. They can store passwords. They can store notes, shareable data, data, so you can share it with friends. And it is cross-platform as well. So one thing I didn't like, though, when I was setting up my own account with Keeper, it asked me for security questions. And that's a huge flaw. Because Why? Because security Who's questions... Who's going to know your sixth grade teacher's aardvark's name? 
It is very easy to figure out this stuff with <laughs> things such as Facebook, like right. what your grandmother's maiden name is. That's why you have to do a, you know, a substitution code. Yeah, you always have to of... lie with your security questions. I would not recommend using security questions for a password manager. And if you do, lie on them. <laughs> so this is what it looks like when you download it. This one's a lot bigger. Uh, it looks simple. I, I wouldn't say clean, but it looks very simple. Uh, but I can store them in different folders. So I have like my Facebook one here, and I, I can just auto share that. I can put it into my browser and be able to use it automatically there. Um, I also wanted to mention, I know this is just three, but there's RoboForm, there's Dashlane, there's Sticky Password, just to name a few yeah. of them that I know are available. A lot, of, a lot of people that love RoboForm, Robert, I do loves, too. Uh, OnePass. Yeah. Um, so many alternatives. Yeah, there's tons of alternatives. So, you know, you have one out there that is available for you. If you can't spend any money, go key pass route. If you don't necessarily want open source hard stuff, then there are other alternatives. Just use just use one. One of them. <laughs> we don't care which one. It be it is. anything. Just have good <laughs> password habits. And of course, if you guys have a quick question for us, it can be anything as well. You can tweet TechThing, post on Facebook.com slash TechThing, or email us, ask at TechThing.com, and we'll do our best to answer them for you. We'll try. <laughs> hey, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. Then we got a special guest joining us. This episode of Tech Thing is brought to you by viewers like you. If you're enjoying the show, please consider donating at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tech thing. You can donate a nickel, a dime, or even five bucks per episode, and that contribution goes directly back into the show production. And remember, if you can't donate, that's okay too. We'd love it if you just share the show with your friends, subscribe on YouTube, or just send us your questions on your favorite social network. Thank you again so much for supporting Tech Thing. We've been getting lots of questions about GPUs, CPUs for gaming, for desktop usage, and the occasional 4K question. So I thought we'd bring on my favorite GPU expert, my partner in crime on This Week in Computer Hardware, PCPer.com's Ryan Shroud. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So I gotta say, I feel like it is too early for 4K gaming unless you have all of the money and don't mind playing like six games. But I... I 4K desktops, in terms of having multiple applications open, I am in love with. How are you feeling about 4K monitors for office use? Uh, I would say for office use, it's 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 much more uh, of a current day benefit, right? You, you'll you'll get more benefit out of it, and kind of if you're doing Excel sheets or interesting things like that, than you will for for most gaming scenarios. Mm -hmm. There's still some complications if you're using Windows and the scaling, right? Because right. Windows Windows kind of like Resolution scaling if, is, is still not perfect. A lot of applications don't use kind of the Windows rendering engine correctly, and so there are some applications that, that look differently. And we even see that on those super high resolution uh, laptops, for example, that like 3200 by 1800 14 inch screens, right, that they mm -hmm. have to use scaling to even be usable. So you, you run into some a little bit more of that complication uh, when using a 4K on your desktop for normal everyday scenario. Right, unless you want to run a you know magnifying glass between you and the world's tiniest icon on that Get gaming it real laptop. close to you. <laughs> I like that thought. So NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 960 came out basically in the last week or two, $199, faster than the 750 Ti, comparable to the 760 and 770, uh, and the AMD's R9 285 and R9 290, or excuse me, R9 285 and R9 280. How are you feeling about this as a GPU option? It's, it's actually interesting, right? So when the GTX 960 launched, mm -hmm. it had an MSRP kind of starting at 199 with uh, some of with most of the SKUs kind of being 10 or 20 or 30 dollars more than that because a lot of them out overclock kind of pre overclocked out of the box. Um, it, it was not a uh, kind of a de facto performance winner. Right which is what we had seen with the GTX 980 and the 970, right? It was kind right. of close in a lot of areas, but when you compared it to the R9 285 and the R9 280, uh, it, it lost in several of those instances, which did not happen with the 980 or the 70, really. Right. Uh, and it, but what it does is it, it offers a lot of features. You know, it's got HDMI 2.0, right, that sure. none of the AMD cards have now, which is nice if you're going to hook it up to a TV and run 4K 60 hertz for video or anything like that. Um, and, it, and it does have a somewhat limited uh, uh, like memory uh, bandwidth right because it has a 2808 bit memory bus which for people who don't know that that essentially means that you could be limited on higher resolution gaming right this is not an ideal 4k 
gaming graphics card, even if you double them up into, sure. into SLI. Uh, but it does run an extremely low power, extremely uh, very power efficiently, you know, kind of using less than 100 watts in a full gaming scenario almost the entire time, which is pretty nice. So it seems like 1440p, you know, sort of as, as, as an entry-level GPU might be the killer, or 1440p gaming might be the killer app for this car. Because in terms of 1080p gaming, it's not that much faster than a 750Ti. Um, it, it should be, it should be somewhat faster at 1080p. I would still, depending on what kind of settings you want to run your games at, I right. think putting this on a 2560 by 1440 monitor might be a little bit of a stretch. Okay. You know, if you go with SLI, then you, then you have that option, uh, because the two gigabytes of frame buffer on there won't be a, a complication, won't be an issue at 25 by 14. Um, but at 1080p, and you got it can also do some interesting things because of that super low power. Like if you game, uh, if you play Dota 2 or League of Legends, you know, the two most popular games in the world, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these retail cards will run with the fans not even spinning while wow. playing those games at 1080p maxed out, right? So you're talking about a 30 to 40 watt thermal level at those at that point. Um, so I, I think for a 1080p gamer, this would still be a better option than 750 Ti, uh, and it's not a significant amount of money increase there either. How does it, I mean, you know, so it's $50, uh, the GTX 960 is $50 more than a 750 Ti. It's about 140 bucks less than a GTX 970. How much faster is a GTX 970 by comparison? Uh, it's going to be a lot. It's going to be <laughs> a significant amount uh, faster. Keep in mind, the GTX 980 is actually double all of the specifications of a GTX 960. And then the 970 is in the middle there, leaning much more really towards the 980. Uh, you're, uh, the 970 is a uh, significantly increased performance card. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, the price difference is there. I do think in the future that NVIDIA will fill in that space between the 960 and 970 with another product, either like the 960 Ti or 965 or whatever they call it. But there's a huge price gap there that they need to fill in uh, with, with a different part. And I don't think that'll be too long before something like that happens. That makes sense. What, what's going on with the 970 being a 35 gigabyte card, or actually a 3.5 gigabyte plus a half a gigabyte card? That is an incredibly complex and uh, interesting subject. Uh, so it came out, so the, the, the 970 and 90 were both released in September of 2014. It came out just a couple of weeks ago that the memory is treated a little bit different in the 970 than it is in the 90. The 980 has four gigs of memory, and it's treated as a single pool of memory. With the GTX 970, it's actually kind of broken up into two different sections, a 3.5 gig part and then a 500 meg part. Now, that combination gets you to 400 or gets you to four gigs, right? Right. But it, it acts a little bit differently um, in terms of how likely it is to use up all four gigs because that last 500 megs of memory is, is slower than the other three and a half gigs. So it's kind of, um, if, if you've ever experienced the issue where you use all of your frame buffer, graphics card and it starts to access system memory that mm -hmm. will kill your performance right it's you're essentially you're, you're dropping from hundreds of gigabytes per second to tens of gigabytes per second and it that's not good for gaming uh the 500 megs kind of acts as an in between those two areas is almost like a, a cache right. but the controversy is that nvidia was not upfront about this they didn't talk about the division of memory they didn't talk about uh, the smaller cache size and the smaller raster operator count that kind of all are based on that same uh, hardware configuration. And some people that bought GTX 970s are upset about it, mm -hmm. but I think for most people, the performance that we tested when it was released and the performance that we tested even fairly recently after it all came still shows the GTX 970 to be a, a very good card for 1080p, 25 by 14 um, 4K is a struggle for one of those cards, regardless. It's a struggle for one 980. Um, so if you're a single monitor guy and you're doing 25 by 14, I still think the 970 is probably the best card mm -hmm. for your dollar there. I wouldn't worry much about the 3.5, 0.5 memory division issue that, uh, that exists now. Good to know. So new AMD APUs and CPUs were announced uh, recently, or at least leaked. Athlon X4 870K budget quad core gaming CPU. That looks like a really good deal for under a hundred bucks. Are you excited yeah. at this point about the, the the new CPUs from AMD, or are they just too far behind uh, Intel performance on the Core i5s? 
It is. It's tough to get super excited about them because if you look at the leaked specifications, mm -hmm. they're very much an iterative increase in clock speeds and performance. Nothing really dramatic here is changing. Um, I, I do think that the that, that X4 part, the Athlon part, has been an extremely popular CPU in kind of like the budget PC gaming builds, mm -hmm. you know, on Reddit and those places. It's in, in, I think the previous iteration of it had kind of been phased out. It was very hard to find. It was kind of going up in price. So this release alone will will make that that kind of update useful as people reintegrate those with those parts. And uh, uh, you know, they, we have another option besides just Intel sure. on those low end budget parts. But none of these CPUs are really they're not going to be i7 competitors in really any regard. So uh, are they going to be i5 competitors in any regard? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, by the mm -hmm. time these come out, I'm trying to think. Are these uh, these are shipping in May? Right. Uh, so we should start to see the desktop iterations of Broadwell by then uh, from Intel. So I really don't know yet, right? right. I think today they might be competitive with uh, some of the lower end i5s uh, and Haswell, but with Broadwell and Skylake also coming out this year from Intel. It's going to be tough. AMD, we really need to see AMD's next generation architecture, which is actually not planned until 2016 for release. I would say we wait with bated breath, but I'm not waiting until 2016 with my best <laughs> breath. It's hard bated. to do. Oh, my goodness. Hey, thank you so much for your time, Ryan. Anything you can tease that's coming up on PC Per this week? Um, what do we have coming up? Uh, we do have a uh, GTX 980, like a super overclocked card that mm -hmm. we're going to take a look at. And I also got in uh, my very first 21 by 9, 3440 by 1440 IPS display from LG. And I'm really excited to see how that is. You were talking about the 4K yes. screens. I actually think this might be the best compromise between a 25 by 14 monitor and a 4K monitor, um, you know, for both productivity and for, for gaming. So I'm very curious to see what my with that. And then LG is very similar to the 21 by 9 Dell and Samsung monitors that we saw at CES? Yeah, 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 yep, yeah, very cool. much so. What's the price going to be? You know, I actually don't, I don't think, I, it's not incredibly expensive, okay. but it's, I, th I think it's around $1,000, something like that, maybe 900 to 1100 I'm trying to figure, I, I can't remember right now, but <laughs> we'll know for sure when we post our, our, our review and video of it uh, sometime next week, so it should be interesting. Know. Hey, I'm excited to see how they benchmark because I, I saw the Dell and the Samsung at CES and just started drooling just a little bit right here. I want that monitor. Ryan, <laughs> thank you so much for making time for us. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ryan Trout, PCPer.com. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks. Last week, Shannon walked through how to unlock your phone for free. Interesting update to that story this week, or kind of why you actually can do this yeah. for free and fairly easily. Quote, starting today, wireless carriers have to unlock your phone. So today, meaning Wednesday when we shot the show, right. was the deadline for an agreement uh, back in 2013 between carriers and the FCC, actually Tom Wheeler at the FCC, uh, that once your contract was finished, essentially, they would have to unlock your phone. Really good write-up up, up on ArsTechnica.com. We'll have the links to that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, postpaid unlocking policy carriers upon request will unlock mobile wireless devices or provide the necessary information to unlock their devices for all their customers and former customers in good standing and individual owners of eligible devices after the fulfillment of the applicable postpaid service contract, oh device financing plan, or payment of applicable early termination fee. Okay. Holy cow. <laughs> and well, basically it says once you've paid for it, they got to unlock it. Which was something that carriers were really loath to do. Just, yeah. Just because you paid for the phone doesn't mean it's yours. And yeah. the FCC said to stop that. So um, <laughs> they were like, "Stop it! Stop that, carriers! Stop it. Silly yeah. carriers!" But that's that's part of the reason why it is so much easier in 2015 to unlock your phone than it was, say, in 2012. Very very happy about that. Yes. And hey, we have some RSS feed updates. Uh, if you haven't found it already, it's over at feeds.feedburner.com slash tech thing. It's updated all the way up to last week's episode. Hey, by the time you're watching this, we'll probably have episode six up there. It works on um, my Android. I can do it on Downcast and Pocket, Pocket Cast, and stuff like that. iTunes, pretty much any RSS subscription. Um, we 
do you have, well, actually, one thing I should point out, uh, John has a, a hot tip. He says, hi, thanks for the hard work getting TechThings RSS feed going. I've been able to view TechThings RSS feed on my Roku 3 using the iTunes podcast Yay! channel. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Yep. Nice work around until the TechThing channel arrives. Thanks for the tip, John. Yes, John, I don't know you. if there's going to be a tech thing channel on Roku, but we are working on getting something like that up and running uh, just as soon as I deal with some other issues. Like, we're aware that the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple TV, and the TiVo can't play back the current files. We're pretty sure it's an issue with our H.264 encoding level. So we're going to have a <sighs> trial version uh, of that file, starting with Episode 6, and actually even before Episode 6 ships fixed, you can <laughs> test. By the way, we're really, really appreciative to everybody that's emailed us and told yeah. us whether it's working on their devices or not, because yeah. we don't have all those devices available. So thank you so much to everyone who's yes. like said, hey, it works on my end, or oh man, my yeah. TiVo, I'm throwing things. If, so, it's, if it's not it. working, keep us posted. Ask yes. at techthing.com, at techthing on Twitter. Facebook.com slash tech thing. You get the idea. Let us know. Yes. We'll keep tweaking it. Um, and our RSS feed is submitted to TiVo. Hopefully that will be hunky and dory in the near future. We've had a lot of requests. Okay, we've had a request. We've had a request for yeah, an SD one. version of the show and several requests for a low resolution or low bandwidth version. Standard def is probably not going to happen. Um, but we will do what we can to get a lower bandwidth version of the show available. And if you want, there is an audio-only version of Tech Thing available at techthing.com. Cool. So, Good to know. I'm figuring out how to set up multiple RSS feeds off of the blog page inside of Squarespace. <laughs> but let's not talk about that right now because the tears, they will flow. Because Aww. me plus RSS feeds equals emotional trauma. Because apparently... I just can't do RSS feeds. Or maybe RSS feeds are even harder than I think they are. In any RSS case. RSS is very hard. <laughs> oh. when, when it's us doing it, it's very, very hard. <laughs> I saw the strangest thing when I was up getting my iPhone replaced after paying the sort of like, because you, you can now basically get Apple Care that will cover breakages, which is great right. because getting the Apple Care and the $79 replacement fee for the iPhone 6 was still a third less than buying a replacement screen and installing it myself, which is why I didn't buy a replacement screen and install it myself. Uh, there was a Microsoft store at the mall oh, I was in. Yeah. So one, the Microsoft store was fascinating because I'd never actually seen a Microsoft store in real life, but also they had a really cool HP Stream 11, which is $199, 32 gigabytes SSD, like two gigabytes of RAM, Windows 8, and is it, there it is, uh, Intel, Intel Celeron N2840 processor. They're claiming like eight hours of battery life. Oh, wow. I'm gonna get one in, it's $199. Yeah, so it's, you're just gonna buy one because eh, why it's, not? Well, it's a Windows. It's like a it's a Chromebook price with a full version of Windows, huh. I think, or it's you know Microsoft Windows. I'm curious thing. how it's gonna run, like how the processor is gonna run. Well, I know Windows 8 is a lot more efficient with smaller amounts of memory than right. Windows 7 was. For example, if you have an old netbook that you've been basically staring at and thinking, what a lovely doorstop, <laughs> um, you could actually if you have like one. You put Linux of RAM, on it. You could, but actually Windows 8 actually runs fantastically well in one or, one or two gigabytes of memory compared to Windows 7 or XP. Yeah. It's still not going to be great, but it's going to be better. It'll I'm just be kind of curious what a $200 Windows laptop runs like. Me too. Okay. Do you challenge me? I, I, I think I'm going to challenge you on this. That, ladies and gentlemen, wraps up this episode of Tech Thing. If you like it, please subscribe at techthing.com or youtube.com slash C slash Tech Thing. And hey, before we go, let me remind you guys, if you haven't backed up your phone lately, do it now. And remember, once in a while, just step away and go outside and maybe get in the sunlight so you don't melt and do something <laughs> analog, like going to this place that I recently found called the California Academy of Sciences. This so is the, fun. so awesome. So I, I went here, I posted some pictures on, on my... Uh, my Facebook's beautiful place. There's tons of wildlife inside. They have this, basically a rainforest room. Oh, well, yeah. But Gorgeous. they have a giant glass globe that is essentially a giant terrarium, like a 40 foot high terrarium. It's, yeah, full it's a terrarium. Of a jungle environment. It's gorgeous. And then um, they have this thing called the Living Roof. Let me find my picture of it. They it's rebuilt really, like a 19th century really cool. building a few years ago. Look at that with the radio tower in the background. So it's awesome. so awesome. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a really cool place. Yeah. Lots of interesting stuff. You can bring your kids there, and it's it's Go a to lot any of science fun. museum. It's good for the soul. I I agree. Calacademy.com is where you can find information on that or .org. Excuse me. I'm Patty Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing.
Let me get my retainer. I can really sound awful. In case you saw me licking my cell phone earlier, turns out coffee with cell phone tastes just like cell phone. <laughs> Are we not recording anymore? Oh, okay. Let's both be smiling this time. <laughs> I'm smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> Music and passion were always in fashion at the Copa. Whee!